Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone who's joined this continuing the conversation with uh, the team at the World Happiness uh, World Happiness Report team and also the Happier Way Foundation. This is our inaugural continuing the conversation on happiness and happiness science, and we welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us. Today we'll be talking about the the one-on-ones of happiness and getting to know more about the world happiness and, and why and where the world happiness has come from um, and its 10 year history. Um, we will have the editors of the WHR uh, asking, oh, well, you can ask a question to the editors of the WHR. So please feel free to uh, put your questions in the chat or tweet them to uh, SDSN and we'll be happy to see you all um, and you know, try to get to your questions. And we're first going to start with uh, founding editor, John Helliwell. And I will now turn the camera or the mic to John. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Sharon. And thank, thanks to those of you who are in our close-in discussion and the, the bigger group for your continuing interest in the World Happiness Report. The whole idea of the report when it first came out was to bring to the broader public views about how well people's lives are going all around the world with the idea of making that a focus of everyone's attention. Uh, I'll start, uh, Shan, with the first slide, uh, which is showing the top and bottom 10 countries uh, in the world in this year's evaluation. So this gives me a chance to tell you what we measure and how we report it. Following Aristotle's advice, uh, we value the quality of people's lives by asking them themselves to rate the quality of their life. Uh, and in this case, it's a zero to 10 scale with the best life as being a 10 and the worst possible life for you being a zero. Here's how people around the world rate their lives. We've shown here only the 10 and top and bottom 10. And we want to make clear that what we're reporting here and what the rankings are based on is entirely what the average values over the three preceding years of what respondents in that country have said. Uh, and so it is none of our decision. It is simply a democratic process of finding out how, bit, how good people think their lives are. Now, that's what we presented in the very first report in 2012, and we immediately got questions, and rightly so. What is it that makes for happy lives? So we then turned to give an explanation. A number of people have now been so impressed by the explanation that, in fact, the explanation becomes the story in a sense that people report as though our rankings were based on these factors. Let me show you what we did. Next slide, which we'll skip by because you can't read it. This is just a replication of table 2.1 in every chapter two. And we'll skip to the next slide and see what it shows us. We then use those data from the slide. We have six variables that explain about three quarters of the differences across countries. And that we, that we can then reply to people how much of our score is coming from different parts of our life. And we can explain that. We have income per capita. We have healthy life expectancy. We have social connections. Do you have somebody rely on in, in times of trouble? Do you live in a generous society? Uh, do you live in a trustworthy society? And do you personally have a sense of freedom to make your key life decisions? And those factors vary a lot. You can see from the colored bars uh, that all of those factors are much higher in the top 10 countries than in the bottom 10 countries. That purple bar across the right is a sum of two things. Dystopia's happiness, which I think is this year 1.83, which is what your happiness would be if you had the world's lowest values of every one of those six variables. So every other country is higher than the 1.83, but you'll see from the very bottom, some of them are not much higher than that uh, 1.83. Um, we then find that 
bar is 1.83, but it's not always 1.83. As you can see, it's big numbers and small numbers. And then it's, we take away from that the extent to which our modeling does not actually explain the happiness in each country. You see the bottom countries, uh, a lot of them, there's a lot of unhappiness that's not explained by the model. And if you look at the names of the countries, you'll see there are plenty of reasons for that. Turn to the next slide, please, Shan. Uh, we then, in this year's report, uh, we were looking back over the preceding 10 years to show how far the world, how much the world has changed. So we look at the preceding the first world's happiness report and then to the latest. And we have these are the top 10 countries in terms of increases in happiness over that period. And you'll see there's quite a concentration of them uh, in the Balkans. And also in other parts of Eastern Europe, there's one of the remarkable trends over this period has been a convergence between Eastern and Western Europe uh, in terms of the average life evaluations. There's still a gap, but it's nothing like what it was uh, 10 years ago. Uh, the next slide shows the 10 biggest losers over that period. And these are in the actual scores. This isn't our attempt to explain why those countries have done better or worse. That's a separate project. Uh, and you can see they're all countries where, uh, a, a lot, typically countries where a lot of things uh, have gone wrong. All of this, of course, gives us uh, grounds for thinking these measures are actually being realistic in what they tell you about the quality of life is. Turn to the next one, please, Shan. People ask us every year we focus on something, and this year we were focusing on not just the rankings, but the whole 10 year history and life under COVID. Uh, and then other things come up in the process. And what came up in the process here, we found a continuation of the result we found last year that life evaluations have been strikingly robust. Uh, during COVID. And we did find, uh, if you look at the right-hand set of bars there, that's negative affect. So that's the sum of worry and, and anger and uh, sadness. And uh, they were up significantly, as we reported last year. That's the blue bar uh, for 2020. But you can see in 2021, they've dropped much closer to the baseline. Now then, look at those left-hand bars. We were not expecting this. Last year, we did find, remember the blue bars are for 2020 and the red bars are for 2021. Back in 2020, there was a significant increase in the helping of strangers uh, on average around the world. But look what happened in 2021. It's twice as big. And in all the other components of we call benevolent acts, volunteering, donations, and helping of strangers, the average we call pro-social. Uh, it's increased significantly driven by helping strangers in 2020, and it's way up in 2021. In the report itself, we have regional graphs showing that this increase has been throughout the world. Uh, every region of the world has had this increase in uh, 2021. And we know uh, that benevolent acts are very important. Uh, next slide, please. This is my last slide before we open it up for your broader discussions. It's a slide that is based on research that we reported in the previous year's report, but remains uh, important here. Uh, we have found, uh, and I, I, I skipped over our uh, trust modeling and our deaths modeling where we showed continuing evidence that the countries with high trust were also the ones that did better in their handling of COVID. Well, benevolent acts are what have jumped in 2021. We have some measures based on wallets. Uh, funny question, but it's been asked and we think it's terribly important because you can actually run experiments. You can drop wallets in cities all over the world. And you can also run surveys uh, uh, asking people how likely wallet return is. Well, we have evidence from both. There is a big study run of dropping wallets in 50 countries. 
Uh, and from the Gallup World Poll, we have expected wallet return in more or less all the countries of the world. Well, this picture here shows you the Cantrell ladder scores. Remember, those are the scores on which countries' happiness evaluations are based. And then the purple bar is wallets actually returned if found by strangers per 10 lost. So it's as high as seven and a half in the Nordic countries, and it's about five and a half in Western Europe, and it's about uh, three and a half to four in all the rest of the countries of the world. And you can see how closely related you are. We found that people who think a wallet is likely to be returned if found by a stranger have higher life evaluations by almost a full point on the uh, latter score. Uh, <clears throat> Whether, however, that wallet, whoever that wallet may be found by. But look also, compare the orange, the, the, the purpley uh, one, which is actual wallet returns, and the green one is expected wallet returns. So people are asked how likely they think their wallet is to be returned if found by a stranger. People think uh, that it's quite likely to be most countries found, returned to found by a neighbor or a police officer, but not so much a stranger. But you can see, the expected wallet return explains the actual return very well, but it's much too low. And so that is something that people didn't expect this upsurge of benevolence. It isn't reported, but this will be our evidence is the first evidence that it's really been happening on a world, on a global basis. But people don't see the benevolence that is around them. And of course that makes them unhappier and it makes them less likely to be benevolent. So this is something we'll be exploring more in the future is uh, how people perceive of the kindness around them as well as how they actually contribute to it. I'll pass it back now for questions, please. Thank you very much, John. Uh, this is the exciting part of the uh, webinar where we can talk to everyone and have questions. And so um, I will will be joined also by Laura Ackman, uh, Associate Professor, and she will be answering questions. And then we're also joined by Nadia and Brighton and Anita from SDSN Youth to help, an, to help ask questions. And on the back end, we also have Max Norton, who can also answer any technical questions that you have about the WHR. So please do uh, join us in this conversation and I'll hand it over to Nadia um, first with the first few questions that you may have. So please go ahead. Hi, thank you, and uh, thank you for inviting me to this conversation. I think that it is indeed brilliant, the study that has been conducted. And uh, well, my first question is very uh, introductive because the concept of happiness is becoming more and more interesting. So um, is it actually a trend and uh, uh, a study that uh, tries to encompass the well-being of the people and connected with also the context in social and economic situations. So uh, since it's the 10th anniversary, how did you see the development in the last 10 years uh, uh, in writing this report? Well, that's very interesting. We sort of got into the report in the first instance, as you know, in order to support the uh, uh, 2012 high level meeting at the UN. And it was only because there was somewhat a surprising amount of interest that we were led to continue producing it each year. And we have continued to produce it each year to an increasingly broad and deep interest. Uh, so we were hoping that the world, that when we think about beyond GDP, you ought to say, well, if you're not going to just concentrate on GDP, you have to have something else that can be a, a strong information base that tells people about life and gives them possibly something to think about making it. And we have been quite struck at how broad this interest has been. First of all, people just wanted to know, how does my country rank? And that was the primary thing. And we said, well, of course, that's just the way we get you in the store. Because the, what's really important is that people want to learn what does make for a happy life so that they don't care where they are now. They're trying to improve lives for themselves and others in their country and others. 
Second thing it's done over this 10 years to a remarkable extent is that the Nordic countries have now been the go-to places for people who are trying to study about what are the secrets of a better life. Why? Simply because they did rank at the top. And so without the World Happiness Report, there never would have been that upsurge of people going off and saying, how do they run their schools? How do they run their hospitals? How do they organize their city administration? What do businesses look like in those countries? All these things, all these aspects, what do late neighborhoods look like? And so now we know and we you can come back and say, well, actually, that is those are all places where the highest proportion of wallets are returned. So this is these are societies where people care about each other. Well, you can do that right at home in your own city, in your own town. These things can be built. I won't go into the consequences, but I'm just telling just giving you some idea of, of this growing bread in and, and the questions we get from reporters and others are deeper and deeper every year. People are wanting to know, how does this affect life in my community? How does this, what can people like me do? How can I change life in my residence or in my town to implement some of these findings? Thank you. Thank you, Nadia. Um, Anita, do you have a question for John and Lara? and maybe Max or anyone else on the team. And Sean, yes, I do have a question. Uh, yes, I do have a question and thank you for inviting me today because I think this is something that's extremely central to the students that I work with on a daily basis because we are a global um, like a network of young people who want to ensure that we have both an equal and happier world. And uh, my question would be, how can we encourage um, like people to work in happiness science if they doubt the usefulness of well-being science, especially due to recent world events and um, the increasingly unequal world that we live in? Well, it's been a long-standing feature of happiness research that uh, happy people don't go to war. Uh, that in fact, peace and happiness are co-determined and that the societies in which people care for each other. You, you can look at the Nordic countries, it's true everywhere. They are among the leaders in accepting refugees and providing un, unmatched aid to other countries, not interested in power. Uh, so it isn't the power over others uh, that gives you happiness or and obviously doesn't produce it for others. So it, it, I think it's, in times like these, in times of stress and trouble, that's where the quality of the social fabric and the well-being it produces are of primary importance. It's when the earthquake strikes, it's when a disaster of various kinds, whether human caused or, or naturally caused arise. And that's when you see the real quality of a society. And so it then becomes even more important to study what creates that high quality society and then help people to rebuild it where it's been shattered or to, or to improve it where it already exists. And it's also a feature of these uh, results that people are simply happier living in more inclusive and more equal societies. And so to reduce inequality and to increase the breadth of the, what's called the social identity, the people we think of as us, to include people in future generations and other countries and all kinds of uh, other differences uh, actually makes people happier. It, obviously, it helps the happiness of the people who are under the bigger umbrella, but it also happy, increases the happiness of the people who produce it. So I think the need for this kind of research is even greater in times of high stress and distress. Lara? Um, I, I don't have too much to add. I think that was a thorough answer, but I, I agree. I think um, I think one of the main contributions of this report is is a shift away from the negative and toward the positive and how it kind of um, encourages us to think about um, not just what are the predictors of ill-being, but what are the predictors of well-being as well and, and seeing how consistently and importantly the social fabric and things beyond just the financial contributions to one's well-being um, matter for, for most people's everyday happiness is really an important contribution. And so um, I think 
during times of stress, we need to focus on what's wrong. But I think when we are able to kind of move beyond that, I think the conversation, um, it, it leads us to kind of imagine and be optimistic and plan for um, how we can build better lives beyond um, the current stressors. So I think, obviously, um, the importance of handling momentary the, the stress that the world is under, I think that's a big concern um, and needs immediate attention. But beyond that, I think the report kind of offers us an optimistic look of, of thinking about how we can build better lives too. Thank you. Brighton, do you have a question for Laura or John or Shun or Max? Um, I could also ask questions that are coming in through Twitter as well, but Brighton, please go ahead first and then I'll ask a question from Twitter. Yeah, thanks so much. Uh, thanks, thanks, John, and thanks, Lara, as well, for providing very in-depth explanations and detailed behind happiness science. Um, I'm also very keen to understand from your experience, um, whether a, a country's happiness depends primarily on individual lifestyles and habits, or there are also other, you know, broader structural forces, perhaps hinging on public policy or the way government is run that contributes to human happiness and well-being. Life is in our social connections. That's where happiness exists. Well, you can see how the answer to your question then becomes not one, not the other, but both. Because it's that it, these individual lives are played out within a broader social context of institutions and of, of relations with others, and indeed built infrastructure, all kinds of things that, that end up affecting how easy and natural it is for people to connect positively with each other. And it's the school system, the healthcare system, the prison system, everything, how they're run uh, depends, uh, has a real influence on the kind of daily lives people lead. So you want them to be able to live in an environment where uh, as they walk down the street, uh, somebody they don't know is simply a friend they haven't met yet rather than a threat to their personal livelihood. So it, the answer is it's an interplay. A lot of, of the work in psychology in the first instance was based on people's individual life circumstances and their emotional responses to those. When we go to the kind of data we collect and how we interpret it, we are looking at what's happening at the community level and the national level where these, where you can't ignore these interplays and, in where, and where you can in fact also study them. So the answer is both <laughs> They're critically important. And indeed it's probably true going through the 10 years. And that's why your question is such a good one. Through the 10 years, there's been more and more emphasis in how we think and how other people react to what are the implications of these findings for how we ought to be structuring and changing the structure of our public institutions and our private institutions and our businesses. Thank you. Thank you, John. I have a, a general question. Um, I believe that's coming in from Twitter's. Uh, is basically, you know, what are, are what are practical ways we can use the information in the World Happiness Report as it relates to us personally? Like, what actions can we do? Um, a lot of it is also, as we know, social connections. You know, what kind of things we can do on the local level in our communities and what part do or what role can we play in terms of encouraging governments or policymakers? You know, I, I would say like, what was the one message for each of those three questions um, that you would give? What would you give for, you know, as some, somebody or personally or people who are just want to improve happiness or think about happiness in their own lives? What can we do for each other on a community level? And what kind of action can we take when it comes to telling our government, like, you know, what can we do? <laughs> so if uh, Laura can start and then John can add to that. 
Sure. I, I think this actually flows really nicely from the last question as well, um, because uh, th there certainly are big um, structural changes that can help <clears throat> bring more social connection, bring more generosity, bring more trust to people's everyday lives. Um, and, and I think those structural changes are important, but sometimes those can be slow, perhaps frustratingly so. Um, and so thinking about ways in which, you know, we can personally and uh, personally implement these changes and what a community can do offers um, a bit more of a tractable solution. Um, and so uh, as John alluded to earlier, some of perhaps um, the strongest predictors of well-being, both in the report and in a large body of positive psychology research stem from really the social connections that people make and have and foster and promote in their, their lives. And so um, on a very, um, on, on, a, on a very explicit level, what people can do is kind of make time and opportunity to kind of foster and build those social connections. The last two years on the surface have been really challenging for that, but people have found very creative ways to remain connected even while apart. Um, and so um, at a very basic level, kind of prioritizing relationships and, and the time we spend with other people, um, whether it be through you know, community softball games or whether it be through Zoom birthday parties um, or some you know, safe form of social connection, there, there's those opportunities. Um, but also perhaps one of my personal favorites is um, through prosociality, which as John mentioned in this year's report, um, showed not only that these levels have increased, but it's also um, one of the top predictors or one of the predictors of, of um, life evaluations over the past couple of years. And so finding ways to kind of contribute um, to one's community or one's local environment, or even the people, the friends and family that are close in your life is um, a really meaningful way in which individuals can take action to promote their own happiness. Um, and it might take a little creativity to think about how these opportunities can be built and scaled in communities. Um, but I don't think we need to look all that far. I've been seeing amazing community programs in my neighborhood, but hearing about them afar. Um, just block parties over the last little while, people have been trying to reconnect with their communities in ways that they haven't been able to see. Um, just people making new friends at newly opened dog parks and, and things of that sort. Um, and even just care packages that I've noticed over um, the first few months of the pandemic. I joined a local website, I think it's called Next Door, where people would, um, you know, it's just for local news announcements, but I've noticed people saying, you know, my eight-year-old has, has aged out of their Lego. Would anybody like a large Ziploc bag of Lego? And people would just start dropping them off on the porch of neighbors, um, finding ways to kind of build connections um, and engage in small acts of generosity, um, which probably also builds trust and connection in communities. On the- I'll stop there. Sorry, John, I didn't mean to leave you hanging. <laughs> No problem. The uh, question is, what can governments do about this? It turns out a lot of these things to create more social connections require some administrative support. Uh, and uh, Lara and I have been working on a research project that tries to improve the lives of the young and the old both by having a school class taught in an elder care facility. And it quite clearly improves the lives of all the people involved. We've had Zoom invasions of these facilities that showed us that in, in spades. So the next question we ask is why doesn't it happen everywhere? And that then turns the light back on the, the, the people who run the services. And it turns out, and you can see this all over the world, that people who run public services are used to getting in trouble because somebody got hurt or some bad act happened in that. And so what happens is they sort of close the whole thing down and make innovation very difficult. So that elder people are locked up in safe spaces, but say they're safe and lonely and unproductive spaces. And the school kids are kept quite separate from other people. And everyone wins when you can get them teaching each other. They're both each other's potential best friends and teachers. But you could imagine the kinds of rules that have to be changed and doors that have to be opened in an administrative way. So in, in an increasingly institutionally risk averse world, people are trying to keep people safe and to, and to stop bad things happening. The point is they're not being sufficiently open to letting good things happen. So to have innovation for happiness, you have to be able to break rules or to make rules that in fact empower people. One more point. 
is that power structures are very important for happiness and for innovation. We find whether it's in schools or in enterprises or in governmental organizations, the flatter, more open structures are more innovative and are happier places for the people who work there and for the people with whom they work in the broader public. Those are big principles, but they have very day-to-day -day applications that you can imagine uh, how they would work out. Thank you, John and Laura. Now there's another question from Nadia from SDSN Youth. Please go ahead, Nadia. Hi, and uh, well, actually I have a question connected to what both of you just said, and uh, it's about happiness is very difficult to measure. So it's not like a very specific data. So how hard was it to find measurable happiness because it very much depends also on the culture on the local uh habits that you have so different uh culture and different region may found uh, may have different values so how has this impact your study and uh, the world happiness report and the second one is uh, very linked so we see that uh, uh, happiness, uh, the happiness of our neighbor, which is either an individual or a country, influences the happiness of the other, and that we have regions of countries that influence each other. So how actually is important uh, the influence, the aura that we can project either as individual or as countries to also enable others to get better, to uh, develop as well? Thank you. Uh, two good and, and tough questions. Let me give you a first a word or two on the first one. Uh, we were impressed to find out how well Aristotle's pr predictions worked. So that to, to measure happiness in the simplest way, which we do, which is just to have a life evaluation, in fact, encompass, encompassed a lot of the other things that are sometimes used and considered as separate definitions of happiness, a sense of like purpose, a sense of flow, uh, a sense of joy, uh, that those things all come into play as determinants of this central umbrella measure. So we've continued to find that the short-term measures respond to short-term influences, life evaluations respond to the broader context. But as Aristotle said, your joy flows through and improves your life evaluation and makes you more open to good things happening and so on. So that's gradual increase in the uh, relevance and power of the central life evaluation has been something we've gained more confidence in over the years. Now the Gallup World Poll has been the best benchmark or best lab we've ever had for studying your question about cultural differences because they spend a lot of time cross-translating questions to make sure and there are indeed some we've identified certain identifiable linguistic tricks in some language where even the best term evokes a slightly different response in one country than another but it turns out that those by and large are of second order importance in other words when we take this basic equation that we use to explain international differences and differences among people, we apply it separately to countries all over the world, the results are strikingly similar. This year, we had a chapter in the report sponsored by a Japanese foundation where they were saying a lot of, all of positive psychology has been too Western centric. It is not picked up on issues that are given much more important in traditionally Eastern uh, cultures. And uh, so they asked a suite of questions uh, relating to balance in life and, and uh, being at peace with life and a focus on self versus others. And we were, uh, some people were surprised, we were not as surprised as some people, that these turned out to be important all over the world. And they were more in evidence, in fact, in, in the, you might regard them as sort of typically Western countries than the North, they're highest. All three of those are highest in the Nordic regions. So although they may have rightly been given more importance uh, in the Eastern cultures, they are 
transcultural. Everybody has these same human needs and, and desires. And so when we actually show them to be important, we show them to be important everywhere. One cultural difference that does show up in the data, uh, and it, can, it continues to show up, and we've had chapters trying to explain it over the years, and I think successfully explaining it, was there's a boost, especially in positive affect, you know, the sort of laughter and joy immediate uh, things, but also in life evaluations in the Latin American countries, above what you'd expect given their values of those other six variables. They're not at the top of the crop in the overall measure, but they're above what you predict given the corruption and uh, other measures that uh, they have, levels of income and social connection and so on. And the answer is uh, they have a broader and deeper set of familial and community social connections that are privileged there. So we have surveys that have asked, uh, how important is it to link generations? And people attach more importance to it in Latin America and do it. So that everywhere in COVID and even pre-COVID, people were in multi-generational households, but it was often regarded as what they had to do because they couldn't afford something else. But in Latin America, it's what they do because they want to do it. And, and, and so whether it's partly through social custom, but it's partly just because they find it works, uh, that in fact, it does make them happier and they do have a higher level of social connection that, that you get and there's spillovers that to others. So, uh, and you might say in some sense, the, the wallet returning habits in the Nordic countries we could learn from both in a sense, right? If you see something that's going on in another culture, more so than in yours, it can be copied. You don't have to say it's something that has to be unique to them, it isn't. So we find the Latin American migrants to Canada end up as happy as other Canadians, plus a little Latin American boost because they have brought in their capacity to see people who are strangers in the street and treat them as friends they haven't met yet. Can I add briefly to that? Um, Nadia, I think it's a really interesting question because I remember when I started studying happiness, I remember thinking it was a magical concept that this is something that would be easily <laughs> um, assessed and interpreted and, and a focus of scientific investigation. Um, but what I think is really fascinating about this research is that um, although some people come in with a bit of skepticism that people can self-report their own happiness, I think one of the beauties is that we've learned over the science of happiness is that people can give um, some insightful um, and personally relevant and, and importantly subjective ratings of how they themselves are feeling. Um, and I'm sure John could cite the question off the top of his head. I, I don't know if I can perfectly, but the Cantrell ladder is a really fantastic measure. That's the central item used to evaluate life evaluations uh, for the world rankings as our kind of primary outcome measure, because it doesn't suppose values on what people should be using to rate their life overall. It asks them simply on this scale from zero to 10, how they rate their satisfaction with their life from its worst possible to its best possible experience. And so it's not supposing that you should be having this much money, this much time, this much Etc. It's asking people to evaluate their life against their own personal standard. And in a way, that's a very transferable question to everybody around the world. Um, and so when it's asked consistently of hundreds of thousands of people around the globe, we can get these amazing perceptions of how people rate them their lives, um, which then um, John and, and, and Shun and Max and Haifeng are able to kind of consider and distill to these national averages over three years and see how countries stack. So um, yeah, I, I, I think it, it seems like this very foreign concept that we're able to to capture this um, life evaluation that people can subjectively report their own happiness. But in a way it's, it's beautiful and simple in that people are asked you know, a number of questions and are able to offer a single meaningful response on kind of this primary outcome um, that, is, that is relevant and personal to them. Thank you both. Thank you, Laura and John. And now Anita has a question for us. Yes, I do. Um, so um, my question is in the last 10 years of the World Happiness Report, are there countries that have backed the trend or have gone against the mold of the um, high income and um, life satisfaction go together? 
Uh, hmm. Well, uh, you're asking whether hmm, specific countries, I mean, what our research has shown is there, it was always a mistake to think of well being and income as being the measures of something like the same thing. They aren't. And there are clearly countries which are richer and, and, and less happy and, uh, and vice versa. Uh, it's probably true uh, if we go, Shan, if you can go to the second slide, the one with the green bars. Give me one second, I'll pull it up. Okay. Or maybe even the fourth one with the gain with the gainers and losers. You'll see that for the countries that have done very badly um, over the last ten years, uh, they're often countries who've lost lots of things. All right, go go further on then, Chan. Yes. Okay. So these are all countries where income may have risen, but other things have risen much more. The the big gainers. Uh, so they're recovering often a more stable society within which uh, connections are better uh, than they were before. And look at the, the largest decreases, Shan, the next slide. These would be examples where everything has gone wrong. Well, uh, you could see uh, Venezuela dropping as much as it did uh, and Lebanon dropping as much. They had a whole range of reasons. Uh, and Afghanistan as well, of which income is as part of the story, but it's nothing like the whole story. If things go really badly, it often affects your capacity to produce income as well, but it's really the other things that are happening that are uh, more important. I, that's not a very good answer. I appreciate that. Um, I think what you're asking more is a... Uh, Anyway, there's lots of ways of digging into that question. Uh, looking at urban people versus rural people, you say the urban people are richer and the rural people are happier. And the reason typically is that they have a sense of community connection. And so anything that raises the sense of community connection in a country or, or a part of a country, uh, and you're looking maybe for specific examples and I, we could dig some out for you. Uh, because these changes do happen. Uh, if anyone else would like to add, we'll go to the next question. But that was a very good question, indeed. Absolutely. Now, now we have uh, Brighton um, asking question. But before you ans uh, before you ask Brighton, I just want to remind everyone to. Um, I know everyone's a, a lot of people are asking questions in the chat. If you could um, try to post your questions in the Q and A uh, box, that would be very helpful. We are collecting all the questions, and anything that may not be answered this time around, uh, we'll try to post on our website. So please keep the questions coming, and thank you for that. Now back to you, Brighton. Uh, thanks, Sharon. Um, I was just looking at the slides. The previous slide displayed. And my, my, my country, Zambia, ranks 138th on the ranking. So that's pretty interesting. And I'd, I would like to, to find out, based on this backdrop, um, and in this year's research, which has highlighted benevolence uh, as one of uh, the key outcomes, has there been any relationship uh, or links between people's trust in governments and institutions? and happiness and their own happiness and well-being? Has there been any link from the, the, the research that has been done and in connection with this year's report? Uh, it, it's been true in every report where we've looked at that question, that that's a very big link. We, I may have emphasized in the presentation, the wallet return uh, by somebody else. Well, of course, the, the wallet return uh, by police is varies even more across countries than wallet return by neighbors or strangers. And that represents a quality of trust in, in government, right? Because the police are uh, the, the agents you meet most often 
in government. And so they're key supports uh, for happiness. More generally, we found that uh, life satisfaction and life in general under COVID was better for countries that had a greater confidence. That was one of the things we modeled last year and this year, is that a general confidence in the ability of your government to make decisions uh, was connected with far fewer deaths from COVID. And similarly, uh, a greater trust in each other uh, had was mark, was evident in the countries that handled the, the pandemic better. And that harks back to what we discovered from previous uh, disasters, that countries that had high levels of trust in their institutions and people in each other, and they're closely related uh, for reasons you can guess. Um, in, it's always easier to start rebuilding at the local level than it is to create the more trustworthy institutions. But in both cases, it, uh, those constructions need to proceed uh, in, in concert. It, it, this whole study of trust, I was drawn into this whole field of happiness because of trust. I was working in social capital at the end of the last century um, and trying to find a way of valuing it. And uh, because yes, it produced higher economic growth. And I said, well, if it's really important to people, it must matter to much more than just economic growth. So we found these measures of well-being. I said, what do you mean we've been doing without these measures in economics for two centuries? If we know what people think of their lives, then we can really value the quality of the social institutions. And the one that was most important in drawing me in was trust. And we had found continually since the value of trust is enormous. You think of it in terms of the income equivalents or any other measure. Um, and it's both, as you say, the trust in public institutions, as well as the trust and confidence in each other. Thank you, John. Thank you. I actually have a question from the question box and this may be for, for Laura. Um, and it's from Mati Matthias, hopefully I'm saying it correctly. Do you make a distinction between happiness and good mental health? I know that has been a, a big topic and we've touched upon it, I guess, twice in last year's report, but uh, maybe you can elaborate or add to it. Thank you, Laura. Sure, I'll, I'll give my take. Um, I don't, in short, I don't know if there's a perfect working definition that everybody would agree with, but I will give you mine, which is informed by my read of the literature. So I think of mental health as a very broad construct that captures multiple domains of how people are doing and how they evaluate their life. Um, a subsection of that I think is subjective well-being, and that's the focus of the World Happiness Report. Um, but there is also kind of um, what some might think of as the reverse side, which is more of, um, uh, if you would, if, if, if I were to consider it like a bucket or a, a grouping of things, it would be um, more of the, the mental ill health. So psychological distress, anxiety, and depression, um, which have many sub facets in and of themselves. And so I think of mental health as this pretty broad umbrella. Um, on the one side is more of the positive functioning side of things. Um, that includes subjective well-being. Uh, and, and scholars in that field have articulated e even ways to, to tease apart constructs in that domain. Um, some of the leading work there suggests there's positive affect, negative affect, and, and a subjective um, a reporting of one's life evaluation, the life evaluation we use here. Um, but then, like I said before, there's this other bucket that kind of includes the uh, more negative experience of mental health challenges, and that's often considered psychological distress, anxiety, and depression. So kind of two broad streams and, and, and more distinctions within them. I can add a tiny bit because this has been a discussion among editors and with audiences throughout the world for several years. Do we properly pay attention to people in misery, whether it's mental health misery or other forms of misery when we're looking at these evaluations as a whole? So we put together a measure which uh, is called the misery index, which are people at the very bottom of, of the scale. And uh, we find out that that does correlate very highly with other measures of negative mental health. 
But we find the correlation between the cross-country ranking, for example, of that misery index and the actual average of the overall life evaluations, which includes, of course, the people at the top and the people at the bottom, is essentially about 0.99. So it isn't as though these are highly distinct things. You're just emphasizing people at the top or people at the bottom or conditions that count on it. So subjective well-being, if, if asked, over a full spectrum includes both the top and the bottom, uh, even if the focus, as Lara has rightly said, has been on looking at the negative states of mental health rather than the positive ones, because for the overall evaluation, it turns out that to create the positive ones can be more important for improving lives in general, in, including the lives of people at the bottom, than actually just focusing on and maybe even stigmatizing uh, uh, mental illness. Thank you, John and Laura. I'm going to go. Uh, so we have about, let's say, seven minutes um, to answer questions. Um, it would be nice, actually, if everyone can turn their cameras on so they know the people who have been answering their questions live and, 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 you know, and answering questions. And this is just a, to kind of just show the group who's, you know, trying to have this discussion, plus doing it with an audience. I am going to open the question to actually, this is uh, more for John, but, you know, please, if anyone has anything to add, um, do you think the growth in benevolence will be sustained? Uh, for example, do you think it represents a long-term shift triggered by the pandemic or just short-term response? And that is from Paul Elliott. That's a lovely question, which we ask ourselves. Uh, and, and we're so glad that we get the chance to see uh, how it plays out. Our best hope is that this is something as people are recalibrating their lives and they've rediscovered their neighbors and they've revalued their families and they've thought again about the, and seen again the value of the social connections that were distanced and are now being recreated that they will recognize the positives that they have been able to build and they'll refashion their working lives and their off working lives in order to give them a chance to spread this benevolence that has happened in 2021. You could imagine there's an alternative point of view that says that's what people do uh, under a crisis but at, when the crisis is over they'll go back and and do all the uh, ill-considered, narrowly focused things they might have been doing before. I'm on the optimistic side of that, but it's uh, since it's a new phenomenon and we can't read the future, I, 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 uh, all I can say is it's a great question. But the others may have something to say about that. I, I just wanted to chime in and mention that there is some empirical work showing this um, uh, this positive, what's the obvious, the opposite of vicious, this um, this reinforcing positive cycle between well-being and prosociality, um, kind of this virtuous cycle, that's the word I was thinking of. Um, and so, you know, hopefully while all of this um, may be stemming from a very difficult, difficult situation where people have been managing a war and a pandemic um, and have come out, you know, in, in higher rates than before or higher rates than before the pandemic to support one another. The hope, and I remain optimistic with John, is that, you know, if people are experiencing the 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 well-being benefits of engaging in this type of pro-sociality that might encourage and spur and reward and um, bring about um, sustained levels. But as John mentions, I, it's an empirical question and we get to see the data next year. Great. I have another question from uh, Miranda Woodland. Um, I think this is an easy answer. Uh, has any collaborative work been done to correlate this data with social determinants of health of health to identify additional trends? Ah, uh -huh, that's, that's a little bit of a Richard question. Unfortunately, he's not here with us today. Well, it, it, the uh, social determinants of health. Twenty years ago, when we were trying to start a science of well-being. Uh, we brought together a whole range of specialties, the positive psychologists and, and the, uh, the leading experts in the social determinants of health. And uh, 
as you know from the social determinants of health literature, it's mainly about economic and relative income positions that are used as the social determinants of health. And there hasn't, there wasn't in that time enough focus. I mean, there was a, a, a nice strand of that literature that emphasized that the people who had good social connections were the ones who lived longer and healthier lives. So that's been a continuing positive common thread between the social determinants of health literature and ours. But where the, the social determinants, it was, more income focused uh, in terms of, uh, you know, if you look at the classic papers on, on uh, when they're looking at the people who are in ill health, they'd focus on the income parts of it much more than on the more easily buildable uh, social connections part of it. So the social determinants of health literature typically had a more material content and not as much of a buildable social content as us, but Increasingly, we work hand in glove uh, with the epidemiologists in that field. And I see no difference now in, in this. In fact, the social determinants of health people are coming up with very different questions, very similar questions, very similar answers to how you ought to be operating in the medical care uh, context in order to improve people's lives. So it's a positive reinforcement now, but it took us a while to get there. Good. Any, anyone would like to add, Sean or Max? If not, we'll go to our final question, um, which is, you know, going back, it's been uh, last week was Earth Day or Earth Week. So um, this is a question from Ikaterina. And she asked, or yeah, she asked, Nordic countries are um, also among the most consuming countries. How can we increase and promote well being without destroying the environment? Interesting question. Well, the, the, it's much easier uh, if you look at all the really big determinants of, of, of happiness, almost all of them are non material. So as soon as you focus on those, then they clearly don't require consumption at all. Uh, and uh, so, and, that, and that's certainly true. You could cut consumption, uh, or redirect it and, and, and keep happiness. The key link that we haven't looked enough at uh, in the environment and happiness is to note that you, when you're trying to improve the environment, you have to change the social norms. And so you change the social norms in a way that lead people to work together and do something to improve the environment, not because they're forced to, but because they want to, and especially done uh, in, in, with the collaboration of others. So the, these changing social norms are, if they're focused in a positive way, are going to be building happiness at the same time they're uh, cutting the worst aspects of consumption and converting consumption into, into happy times with others. Thank you, John. Anything to add, Laura? No, I, my, my knee-jerk reaction was the same answer John offered, <laughs> which is that you know the key predictors of happiness are not necessarily material. So shifting our focus away from that um, can, can offer a lot of opportunity. Great. I'd like to thank John, Laura, Max, Sean, Philippa, Nadia, Brighton, Anita, Ellie, and of course, our team at SDSN for hosting this uh, event with Happier Way Foundation, one of our partners and helping us with our research. The conversation doesn't end here. Everyone had wonderful questions. We will try to write up a, a nice blog post about this event and um, we invite you all to join us for the next webinar events. I think some of the webinars that are coming are actually gonna answer some of the questions people had about trends and measurement. The next one will be uh, June 7th, uh, also the same day and time, time, which is 11 a.m. EDT, which is a trends and concepts of progress in well-being. Um, a lot of the talk about GDP and beyond GDP um, and national um, you know, different measurements of happiness. And then we will also on July 12th talk about insights from the first global survey of balance and harmony. 
we hope you'll be able to join us. You can go on our website and register. We will also be sending out a survey to all the participants and people who've registered for this. We do wanna keep the conversation going. So if you have any suggestions on how these conversations should, should go and uh, we, we welcome your information or your suggestions, um, please keep asking us questions so we can be more engaged because we do take these questions into consideration when we do have the editor meetings. Um, so please do, thank you for joining us. And again, thank you to everybody and especially our partners, Happier Way Foundation. Thank you.